Hey there anthropologists, here with another video. Today I thought I'd talk about kinship systems and talk a little bit about how kinship is organized and the history of, of kinship studies in anthropology. Can I say kinship one more time? Kinship. So the key things to talk about today are affinal ties, affinal, however you want to pronounce it, affinity, and consanguinity, so blood relation or lineal descent, how you trace descent. And really all of this comes from one particular guy in the 1870s, Lewis Henry Morgan. If you've taken an intro to anthropology class or um, learned about the history of anthropology, you probably recognize the name. Arguably speaking, this 1871 publication, uh, Systems of Consanguinity and Affinity of the Human Family, 1871, I would argue is probably really the first you know publication in anthropology as a discipline. Um, I mean, there are other publications that came out around the same time that you could argue are also anthropology, but this one's really what solidified the discipline and got it started um, in its early heyday. Now, obviously, 1871, it's a lot of terms that we would not use today, and it's definitely, you can tell, it's old and 19th century in its writing. But the kinship systems that Morgan developed, we still very much talk about and use today in anthropology. And there are six different kinship systems that we can talk about. And the ones I wanted to talk about are the ones that we derive from Morgan. So before I really get into all the differences between what's going on here, these, these uh, six different systems, which are Hawaiian, Sudanese, Eskimo, Iroquois, Crow and Omaha, we should probably back up and talk about, you know, what are some other key terms that we need to know? Well, when we talk about kinship, we're talking about, um, here, let's make sure my marker is large enough size. We need to remember that it's in relation to the ego. That's the self. That's me. So my understanding and my kinship network, which is what we would call these, is going to look different than my sister's who, you know, in relation to herself, is going to have a different relationship with cousins and also with you know, her husband's family, my brother-in-law. So that's an example right there. The person she married is my brother-in-law to her. It's her husband. So that's just something to remember is that we're always talking in re reference to the ego. And what's also important is that we're also usually categorizing things around the nuclear family. So anthropology since 1871 has obviously realized that the nuclear family is not this end-all be-all, this idea that mother, father, brother, sisters, siblings, and whatnot are the only way you can categorize a family. And in fact, what we find anthropologically and genetically is that the minimum number of individuals that you need to have in a community to have sexually viable offspring and reproduce and you know all the, the evolutionary minimum is generally considered to be 25. Now that's arguably speaking the size of many people's families. So it raises the question of incest tabo taboos and all that kind of stuff that we could get into, but we're not really gonna focus too much on them for this video. But suffice to say, one of the sort of hangups of this kinship system is it's assuming sort of the nuclear family and the ego as the center of these kinship networks. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean there's no utility in them otherwise. Actually, let's stretch that out again. The other important thing to keep in mind is the differences between generations and also within the same generation. So we would probably call this collateral kin right here, and this would be generational kin. Or actually, I think there's another term for it. I'm just not remembering it properly. And a lot of cultures distinguish not necessarily along ego, um, but they might have other terms that distinguish based on your re relation to other age grades. So we would call these sociocentric. This is what Elman Service called them back in the 50s. You don't really see this term used a whole lot, but I think it's pretty useful. So an example of this might be senpai and kohai. So in, in Japan, you know, recognizing your age in relation to someone else. So in America, it might be inappropriate for us to ask, how old are you? But in Japan, it's more common because you want to be able to know, should I call you senpai or kohai? Um, and, you know, is that used as frequently today? It's still seen, but this would be an example of a sociocentric term. So things to re remember are the differences between generations and within generations are usually how kinship networks are organized. They're also organized by gender. So you'll notice we use the triangle symbol here. That's usually um, gender, I should say, sex, not gender, because gender is, as we've already talked about in other videos, is a cultural construct. So we should be really careful with using the term gender and specifically re be referring to reproductive sex. Um, so males are indicated in the triangles, females indicated with circles. So 
we should probably start with familiar territory and we're actually going to scroll down and not start with Hawaiian kinship, but we're actually going to start with Eskimo kinship. Now Eskimo is a term that comes from the 19th century. It's not really a term that means anything to us today, except for in the context of this kinship system. We'd probably more accurately refer to this as Inuit, uh, Aleut, Athabascan, or some other um, similar term in maybe Inuktitut or uh, Yupik or Aleut. Uh, so Eskimo is the system that we in Western industrialized societies use. You probably recognize all the terms in this kinship network, mother, father, uncle, aunt, uh, cousin, sister, and brother, right? So we distinguish the nuclear family from the rest of the family. And this is how we organize it in uh, North America and in English. And this is not necessarily the only you know, way you can organize it, but this is what leads to sort of confusion with sort of uh, first, second, third cousins and removals because it's all in relation to this nuclear family. So if you're not in the nuclear family, you are a cousin. So this would be your first cousin. But what do I mean when I say a second cousin? Well, we have to remember that everything is relative to the ego. So let's look at this cousin that I've circled right here in red. Now to say that I have a second cousin, so remember we are ego, we're over here, would mean this person who, you know, they have a husband who has a sister and she has a son and a daughter. So this cousin also has cousins. And because it's a cousin of a cousin, that is my second cousin. And then if we do it again, iteratively, your third cousin is your cousin's cousin's cousin. So when we say that FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt back in the 1930s, we'd say oh, they're fifth cousins. Well, really what we're saying is uh, FDR is Eleanor Roosevelt's cousins, 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 cousin. So when we get, get to fifth cousins, we're really genetically very, very far removed from any sort of similarity that would be anything to be concerned with. And in fact, re remembering what I said before about genetic sort of minimums in a group of 25 odds are most of the people in that group of 25 are going to be first cousins with one another so really this idea that there's a genetic like predisposition for incest taboos against cousins just doesn't really hold up evolutionarily so in terms of incest taboos it's kind of tricky so that's the eskimo kinship system now we're going to get into some systems that you're probably not familiar with and hopefully um it doesn't get too complicated. We'll start with the simple one here, and that's Hawaiian kinship. Hawaiian kinship pretty much just distinguishes along generational lines. So anyone a generation above you is a mother or a father. Anyone in the same generation with you is a brother or a sister. Now, you might say, oh, that, that gets kind of confusing. How do we distinguish between cousins and brothers and sisters? But one could argue that the cultural incest taboo makes it very easy to distinguish between sexual reproductive partners and non-sexual reproductive partners. Anyone that you don't call a brother or a sister Boom, right away they are now an eligible partner. Um, and so cousins, in this case, are considered not viable sexual reproductive partners. Um, so, you know, you could argue first cousin marriages in this case is an incest taboo. Just through the sheer concept of brother-sister incest taboo is a universal uh, culturally um, in, when first cousin marriage is, is not. So that's the really general term. So it can be mostly based on generational differences. We can also go to the opposite end of detail and get as hyper-specific as possible. So the most specific of these six kinship systems is the Sudanese kinship system. So this is where every person has a specific term for them. Now, in the Eskimo system, you'll notice that we have words for aunt, uncle, mother, father, cousin, brother. But we don't have words for those in English because we don't follow the Sudanese system. So to say, you know, your father's brother we have to use multiple words in English. Whereas in Sudan, they have a specific word for father's brother and father's sister and mother's sister and mother's brother. So whereas we would just call this an aunt and this an aunt, uh, two different words for, for this relationship between people. And really what this is doing is hyper-specific distinctions between family members in the, relative to the ego. Um, and you also notice maternal po parallel cousins, maternal cross cousins, they all have their own terms as well. So this is the sort of opposite end of the Hawaiian kinship system, hyper-specific. And then if we scroll down here, the last three that we want to talk about, the Iroquois, Crow, and Omaha, have a lot to do with um, unilineal descent or flip-flopping uh, descent. So 
when we talk about descent, we're probably accustomed to bilineal descent, where we trace lineage through the mother and the father. Um, we don't necessarily, you know, treat treat it as the mother's line or just the father's line to the exclusion of the other sort of descent groups. But when we talk about Crow, Omaha, and Iroquois, we do need to distinguish between matrilineal, so tracing through the mother's line, and patrilineal, tracing through the father's line, so mater and pater from, you know, Latin. So we'll probably start with the simplest one, and that's, well, yeah, I guess Iroquois, which can go either way. So there are Iroquoian-speaking uh, families where they trace lineage through the mother, matrilineal, or they trace it through the father, patrilineal. And it's a pretty flexible system that can adapt to either or. Um, and it's pretty amenable to a lot of clan and tribe-based organization. So you'll notice that um, all of the same sex on your mother's side is given the same term. So your mother's sister is also your mother, but your mother's brother is your uncle. And then you'll notice that anyone on your father's side, all of your father's brothers are your father and your father's sister is your aunt. So basically distinguishing between parental roles. So in one way we could think of this as a way of conveniently identifying allo parents. So, you know, your aunt in an Eskimo system doesn't have any um, distinguishable terms. Therefore, they are treated with the same sort of roles and responsibilities as the person who actually pushed you out of her womb. Um, so that would be the Iroquois system. And then you'll also notice because of that, sort of similarity based along sex where your mother's sisters are all your mother um, you'll notice that because of that your mother's sister's descendants are also your brothers and sisters so this leads to pushing out further away where your cousins begin based upon the sex of the um, generation above you so that's the Iroquois kinship system pretty straightforward now we're going to get into territory that might get a little confusing because you might be looking at these two down below and say, whoa, 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 hold up. Within the generation, I have someone of the same age being called a sister and an aunt within the same generation. That's weird. So to an unward order, under, eh, if I can speak sentences, in order to understand that, we need to remember that the Crow system is matrilineal and the Omaha kinship system is based on patrilineal descent. So in the Crow kinship system, they trace through the mother. So the mother's sister, of course, we're going to, again, just like the Iroquois system. But notice right away, the mother's brother is called the uncle. And the reason behind that is he is not going to be providing any lineage of his own. So he, or not lineage of his own, he's going to be providing offspring. But because descent is traced through the mother's line, we want to actually treat this, anything that's your mother's sister, as the same matrilineal descent. And then same with the father, similar with the, the Iroquois system. And then when we get over here, your aunt and any of her offspring are given the same respect and authority as your father. And that stems from the fact that this is matrilineal. So, you know, the females of this group have different, um, you know, cultural significance because descent is traced through female line. Uh, so, of course, that's where we see the largest distinctions in how kinship terminology is, is um, used. Now, if we go to the Omaha kinship system, we notice the pattern flips. So now your mother, your, your I guess you could say your father's uh, brother, still father, and then your uncle, in this case, is your mother's uh, uncle. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to. No, oh, my gosh. It's all blurring together. Your mother's brother. There we go. So even anthropologists get tongue tied with these things. And the reasoning behind that is because you're tracing lineage through the father's line, you want to clearly d differentiate this person is not through the father's line. That's a male through my mother's line. Therefore, descent should not be traced through him. He, any of his, you know, children are also my uncles as well. To clearly distinguish between your father's lineage and any male relatives of yours who are not tracing descent through your father's line because he is... Um, Affinal, or he's through affinity, through the marriage to your father. Um, so that's the main distinction between Omaha and Crow. That's where it can get a little tricky because unilineal descent might seem straightforward at first, but that's also relative to us being raised in Eskimo kinship networks. So hopefully that makes things a little bit more um, concise, understandable when we're talking about kinship and get really complicated. What I didn't talk about is how people choose kin or create fictive kin networks, such as godparenting, um, 
friends and family oh, or friends and family creating friends as family um, that's where it can get a, more complicated as well and that's when we talk about economics and we talk about reciprocity that's where those sort of social relations become really important but that's not really the point of this lesson it was mostly about kinship and understanding the basic kinship terminology to help you better understand your own lineage and how your own genealogy can be traced so I will see you guys in the next video and until then never stop learning